is Kevin Bishop, uh, Chief Executive for the National Park. I'm billed as the Master of Ceremonies. It's the first time I've ever been billed as a Master of Ceremonies. I think that's a rather grand title. Uh, keep the speakers on time, do the safety announcements, make sure everybody's turned their mobile phones off, although I think if you've got a mobile signal you've done really well. <laughs> Uh, and ensure that everyone knows where they're going at the break and so forth. Uh, my first task is to introduce Tom Stratton, who is Deputy Land Steward for the Duchy of Cornwall. Uh, the Duchy are very key partners within the National Park in terms of their land ownership, but more importantly because of their interest in conservation issues. Uh, and uh, also I'd like to introduce Andy Bradford, um, who is the tenant at Brimps, uh, and his dogs, who've now disappeared. <laughs> so, anyway, Tom. Good morning, um, everybody. A warm welcome to uh, Brimps Farm on behalf of the Duchy and uh, Andy and Gabrielle. Um, in a moment, um, I'm going to pass over to Andy. He's going to tell you a little bit about life at Brimps and what they're, they're up to at the moment with a particular Meadows um, leaning. But if I may, I just wanted to say a few words um, on behalf of the Duchy. In July last year, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales visited Brimps, and as part of the visit, um, His Royal Highness received an update on the Meadows work taking place on Dartmoor to raise the profile of the nationally significant extent and quality of habitat that exists here. The enthusiasm that has been shown by people for Meadows and their management has been absolutely overwhelming, and the support for this event is um, absolute testament to that. At a point where the policy supporting the extensive systems of farming and management needed to protect these vital habitats will shortly be subject to review. I can personally think of no better time uh, to raise the profile of their special qualities and the need to support their onward sensitive management. The Dutch is delighted to be able to support this event, which has so enthusiastically, and I have to say professionally, been put together by Donna Cox um, of More Meadows with support. <laughs> It's an absolutely fantastic um, achievement, um, and um, we're, we're, we feel privileged to be part of it, as I'm sure to the other funders. And um, Don has received support from the HLF funded More Than Meets the Eye project and uh, the National Park Authority. The programme for the day looks absolutely fantastic, and I think it's nice that we're looking at other aspects linked to meadow management rather than just the grassland, the beekeeping, the identification, and those sorts of things, which I hope you'll all um, enjoy. And our thanks must go uh, not only to Dom and her team, but all, all those who've given their time to make this a, a really positive and successful event. I know a lot of people have, um, have travelled uh, from elsewhere in the country, some of whom I met last night, and um, thank you very, very much indeed. If I may, I'd like to read um, a statement by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Um, whilst this statement is taken from an afternoon of speech that His Royal Highness made in April for the organisation um, Plant Life, of which is Ryan Mrs. Patron. Um, he has formally approved uh, the relaying of this message to you today to show his support for the work that is going on both locally and nationally. Invisible for much of the year, meadows can often look like any other field of soft green. Yet in just a few weeks, the magic and complexity of our remaining wildflower meadows is revealed to enchant us all. It is always a wonderful moment when the wildflower meadow in my own garden at Highgrove comes into bloom each year. An ever-changing tapestry, it is the result of the gradual process of restoration over the last 30 years or so. When people see the meadow, they often say that it reminds them of their childhood. But as time goes on, there will be fewer people for whom this is true. I remember my excitement some 30 years ago at discovering the first single wild orchid to appear in the meadow at Highgrave. Last summer, there were 5,700 consisting of seven different species, counted, I should say, by plant life, rather than Israel Islands. <laughs> the uh, dismal truth is that a meadow established over generations can be lost in a single afternoon or more. 97% of our wildflower meadows have vanished since the 1930s, and the loss continues today. The challenge of reversing that trend can feel overwhelming. Continuing the, this important task relies on the foresight and generosity of people such as yourselves, and I could really not be more grateful for your support. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have a fantastic and informative uh, day, um, and I look forward to joining you for at least part of it, and uh, now passing to 
Andy, who's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Brimps. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, pl a pleasure and a privilege, really, to host this day today. Um, we've um, been here now nearly 50 years at this particular farm. Uh, my mother arrived here in 1947, actually, uh, just after the war, and uh, I think that's our sort of beginning of our the love of Dartmoor. Um, I arrived in the early 60s. We farmed across the valley, actually, before we came here. But um, and I remember as a child looking up to these oxide daisies and all these sort of things, you know, thinking, oh, that looks nice. But I must confess, I've been a sinner in my past. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we used to grow swedes and potatoes, and, um, and my claim for fame, actually, I used to last two gallons of DDT in the West Country. Which is uh, pretty bad stuff, really. I must say, it's pretty appalled by the whole thing. Um, but this has been that for over 35 years now. But, um, but we've always had an interest, or my personal interest, and my, especially my mother, really, in the flower side. I'm not very good at identifying, I must say, I thought that doesn't look very pretty. But um, we're very lucky to have a few ancient meadows here, but also we have some meadows in transition, so lot to see today, and um, you know, we'll chat and talk as the day goes by, but uh, enjoy the day. I want to um, stand in the way these wonderful uh, set of people are going to be talking to you today. So. Um, we all look forward to, you know, seeing how it all goes and um, have a good day, as I say. Thank you. Andy, I might be a bishop, but I don't think I can absolve your sin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and also, pinch in the punch, first of the month. And it's also, I believe, National Meadows Day. So happy National Meadows Day. Um, and can I just say from a personal perspective how timely this conference is? So, um, and this isn't a political statement, but uh, our politicians seem to have forgotten about the environment. So to have uh, a packed marquee, 150 odd people, a programme, a conference sold out within two to three weeks and a long waiting list, it's heartening, isn't it? Because actually nature is important for all of us and we forget its importance at our peril. Uh, and like Andy, I'm no expert. Um, I'm here to learn and to try and keep things on track. So let me um, introduce our first speaker, Stephen Moss, one of Britain's leading nature writers, broadcasters and wildlife television producers. I'm sure we've all watched Springwatch. Um, well, he was the original producer of Springwatch. Um, if you read The Guardian, you'll be aware of his Birdwatch column. He's a lecturer in travel and nature writing at Vassar University, and he's president of Somerset Wildlife Trust, passionate about communicating the wonders of the natural world, and in his spare time, he's married with five children and lives in Somerset. <laughs> so, Stephen, the floor is yours. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. I love the way Kevin said there's 150 odd people. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. <laughs> Hallelujah, we are odd. <laughs> and praise to the sinner who repented. <laughs> um, I joke, but when I left the BBC after 29 years, which um, is more than you get for murder nowadays, um, a colleague of mine saw me talking to a, a friend who'd seen a bullfinch. And he said, I thought you were going to put your hands on her shoulders and like an evangelical preacher say, have you heard the good news about wildlife? I said, yeah, that's sort of what I do. I'm an evangelist for nature. And so are all of us. That's why we're here. Um, huge thanks to Donna for organising this. Just a wonderful event. And you've got some real treats later with some fantastic speakers. Um, but I thought I'd kick off reminding us what wildflower meadows are. Um, and while it seems a little bit um, funny to read from one of my books. The good thing about this is this was written by my colleague Brett Westwood because we wrote a book together. And I, I was thinking, I'm sure we had something about wildflower meadows in this book. Um, it's called Wonderland, by the way. Google it on Amazon. You find a Take That album. <laughs> Which I think explains why it got to number three in the charts. At one point. <laughs> Seriously, it did. Anyway, I'm just going to read this. It's a lovely piece written by Brett, who is a wonderful, wonderful naturalist. A friend of mine advises me to never go on a picnic with an ecologist because all ecologists do is point out how good things 
used to be. <laughs> Gazing over the wooden gate this afternoon, I remember his words. No lush green meadow this. The small hedge-lined field is a sea of purple and yellow, tinted by clusters of cowslips and countless thousands of green-winged orchids. The other sign belongs to the meadow's modern owners, Worcestershire Wildlife Trust. Gingerly, I pick my way between orchids no more than 20 centimetres high, each spike a different shade of pink, from rich magenta to pale rose. See, Charles, it's not just you who've got orchids. <laughs> Down at their level, the variety of foliage is astonishing. The kidney-shaped leaves of sorrel whose spikes, like miniature rhubarb, are beginning to rocket upwards. They jostle with the sawtooth leaves of yellow rattle, a hemi parasite, oh, it's pretentious, isn't it? A hemi parasite that, by drawing some of its nutrients from the grass, reduces its strength and makes room for herbs. George Peterkin, who has celebrated the history and natural history of our meadows, admits that these traditional grasslands have no part in modern commercial farming. They are relics of an age before the Second World War, when meadows were mown by hand. The great productivity driver of the 1940s and since has seen these weedy pastures either ploughed up or enriched with fertiliser. A few hardy buttercups and dandelions remain, but in most cases, lush green deserts of grass prevail. Now that's true, and of course, one of the key things about meadows is the history of them and what happened to them. And I just wanted to show you a, a, a clip that I did from a series called Britain's Big, sorry, called Birds Britannia a few years ago, which was looking at how we got here in the first place. And it's a very it's an interesting clip because it goes back right the way to the Second World War. So if you could please run the first clip. Could be this was the 6,000 acre wilderness of Peltwell Fen in southwest Norfolk, where nothing grew save weeds and weeds. Scrubland of peat and bog, where floods more frequently than not turned it into a vast morass. But it has taken a war to turn that same wasteland into an agricultural gold mine. The Ministry of Agriculture has set to work an army of men reclaiming the idle acres. Across the pen... As the war dragged on, with national food shortages and the prospect of widespread starvation, desperate measures had to be taken. So huge swathes of our countryside were ploughed up for agriculture. The entire emphasis was on maximising production. And you can only do that by taking out what you call the wasteland, and the wasteland included um, half of all our ancient woodlands, 70% uh, of our heathlands, I think we've now lost 99% of our flower-rich meadows. Any habitat that wasn't yielding agricultural produce was converted to arable or to farming in some way. The irony was that the more we planned and organised and structured the future of the British countryside, the more we lost sight of some of these aesthetic and romantic impulses that people had for the landscape and for the birds that lived within it. During the post-war years, the juggernaut of the agricultural revolution was unstoppable, fueled by subsidies and new technology. It was goodbye to the old-fashioned values of Tony Pippett and welcome to the brave new world of men in white coats. And the boffins came up with what appeared to be the perfect solution to improving productivity. There was a bright new future for Britain, not only for industry, but also for the countryside. And so in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, we sought to get rid of inefficient farming methods and systems and replace them with cutting edge new technologies at the time. And one of those technologies was the application of pesticides and the birth of what we now know as chemical farming. So you suddenly had this interesting combination of a bunch of chemicals that could kill pests um, and a need to increase food production. And at face value, it must have seemed very straightforward you know you get more of a crop if you remove the weeds because the crop gets all the food from the soil but these revolutionary new farming methods were having terrible effects on our countryside birds the two main problems were the destruction of habitat and the widespread use of pesticides one it was 
degrading the whole landscape. And a lot of the wildlife depended on the wild plants, the rough bits of the countryside, the wet bits and so on and so forth. And if you've spent lots of time and effort wiping out the so-called pests, what that means is that when you kill the moths, you kill the butterflies, you kill the caterpillars, and you actually remove that element of the food chain. As a result, the populations of many farmland birds went into freefall. Eventually, environmentalists woke up to what was happening and began to warn against the catastrophe of a silent spring. But when it came to a choice between farming and birds, there could only be one winner. There was a kind of illusion, I think, in governments and actually in society more widely that what was good for agriculture was good for the countryside. People believed that the countryside was safe in the hands of farmers. But I think no one really had grasped the fact that actually there was a, a, a difficult choice to be made between maximising agricultural production and attempting to maintain a kind of rich, diverse wildlife in the countryside. One man who witnessed the calamity in the countryside at first hand was the author Henry Williamson, whose books, including Tark of the Author, had made him a household name. After the hit, after the war, or when I had sold my farm and returned to North Den in my writing, the general use of other sprays on arable and grasslands caused the deaths of a great number of birds, including such predators as sparrowhawks, owls, and buzzards. Williamson, a farmer himself, recalled finding a family of grey partridges, all poisoned by chemicals. I came across the two birds, crouched side by side in death, with their chicks slightly larger than humblebees, cold between the protecting feathers. Removing that, isn't it? And it, it, it does explain very clearly the logic behind it. And no, no one wanted to destroy the countryside. Farmers have got a job to do, they've got to produce food. We demand cheap food, which of course is at the absolute heart of, of all this. Um, but I think it comes down to something that several people touched on in that clip, which is the notion we have of the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the idea we have of the countryside. And this is something that preoccupies me. Um, partly because I don't really, I'm in my late 50s, I don't really remember hay meadows. I remember a few areas, you know. So, so if that's true of me, you know, in 20, 30 years, there will be no one left who remembers the fact that the countryside, this was normal to have hay meadows in the countryside. And this is what George Monbiot and other people call the shifting baseline syndrome. And it's a real worry. It's when we think that a bird or a flower is scarce, because it has been scarce since we were young. Or, you know, whereas actually it didn't used to be. It used to be very common. We know about things like the red backed tribe and, you know, things have disappeared. But it's true of so many birds and wildflowers now. Things like corn cockles have virtually disappeared. Um, so that's something that we have to be very careful about because when we start trying to restore things, people say, well, it was never like that round here before. Well, of course, it, it hasn't been for 60 or 70 or 80 years. So unless you ask someone who's very old, they're not going to remember this. Um, I wrote a book recently called Wild Kingdom, which is, is, I suppose it's the first angry book I've written. I've written a lot of new nature writing. And the criticism of new nature writing, and it's a very valued criticism, is that it, it can be a little bit self-indulgent. Um, I hope this book isn't self-indulgent. It, it, it was me saying, we've got to do something. I, I am an optimist, but I'm going to read you the start. The first chapter is... Um, about farmland, and I'm just going to read you the passage which for me sums up our, our ambivalence about what the countryside means, and I'm going to just play you one more clip and then we've got time for some questions. To really appreciate the way that successive generations of farms have transformed the landscape, I only need to take the M4 motorway from Wiltshire towards London. On both sides of the road, for mile after mile, the predominant colour is green, a patchwork quilt of various shades, occasionally 
broken by a square of wheat or barley or the electric yellow of oilseed rape, but mainly the green of highly fertilised grass grown for grazing or silage. In the words of, words of cultural historian Michel Pastoreau, green is a ubiquitous and soothing presence as the symbol of environmental causes and the mission to save the planet. But this vivid emerald hue has nothing natural about it at all. This dazzling green is the colour of intensive farming, and by associating it with something positive and natural, as many of us continue to do, we come blind to its real meaning. So try this simple experiment. Look across an intensively farmed landscape and imagine that every green field you can see is a vivid, luminous red, the colour we associate with danger. Now imagine seeing field after field of magenta, scarlet and crimson stretching off into the distance like a scene from some manic filmmaker's futuristic apocalypse. You might not be quite so inclined to regard our farmed countryside in quite the same way. The reason this is so important is because it covers more than twice as much land as all our other wildlife habitats combined. <coughs> the Oxford English... So, sorry, um, without question, farmland is far, by far the most important habitat in the country. This is also what we call the countryside. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the word countryside as the land and scenery of a rural area, while its Cambridge equivalent expresses the concept in rather more passive terms, land not in town, cities or industrial areas, that is either used for farming or left in its natural condition. But neither of these definitions gets anywhere near capturing the profound resonance of the word countryside to the British ear. This resonance is shaped by memories from our early childhood, poring over picture books showing kindly farmer Jim on his bright red tractor, surrounded by happy-looking hens, pigs and cows. It's fuelled by the cultural connections from the poetry of Keats to the music of Vaughan Williams. And it's reinforced each day as we're bombarded with bucolic images on advertising hoardings which exploit our deep love of the countryside to sell us everything from milk to mortgages. These images take us far beyond any prosaic meaning of the word countryside. They conjure up a rose-tinted view of rural Britain held dear by millions, one that is shamelessly exploited by self-appointed minority interest pressure groups who claim to be the guardians of the countryside would be amusing were its consequences not so serious. I'm talking about you, NFU. <laughs> Although this simple word evokes a sense of pride, warmth and affection in the hearts of millions of Britons, we need to think again. The truth is that the vast majority of our local countryside is a food factory. Farmers will tell you that their primary job is to produce food, and they're absolutely right. What they may not tell you is that under the current system, in which supermarkets continually force down the prices they pay farmers in order to provide cheaper food for us and better profits for shareholders, the farmers themselves have little or no choice but to maximise their yields. And in practice, as we know, this means removing hedgerows, removing hay meadows. That, you know, this is not the farmers' fault. Farmers get blamed all the time for this. And it annoys me because, you know, there are whole gradations of farmers, as we know. Many, many farmers I know, the ones I live around in Somerset, the ones I've met when I've been filming, do their absolute best against the odds and against the system to try to make things better. And what we've ended up with is a situation where something like hay meadows are seen as some kind of bolt-on luxury. But it then raises the question as to what the countryside is. Are we happy that it is simply seen as a place for producing food with a little bit of recreation tagged on the end? Or should we make room for wildlife? Now, I know what you think, but you're not the ones I have to convert. You're the congregation. We have to go out and evangelise for this. And it's really quite tricky. You know, I was listening to the radio yesterday about the reintroduction of links. And, of course, once again, the interviewer farmer said, well, we've got to produce lots of food, we've got to be self-sufficient in food, we're not self-sufficient in food, we're all going to die. And it's like, no, we're not. We export vast amounts of our food around the world. So don't tell me that that's the issue. But the issue clearly is we need to be intelligent. We need to work with very good farmers, of which there are many, who and, and encourage them both, not just financially, but most importantly, we need to encourage them by making it easy to get to do the things that work. I've filmed on the Marlborough Downs, fantastic collective there. First thing they tell you, when you meet the farmers on the Marlborough Downs, the first thing they say is, I'm not some bloody retired rock star, you know, who can afford to lose money. My job, you know, I'm a fifth generation farmer, my job is to produce food, you know, that's my job. Absolutely. Go around the farm, and there's yellow wagtails, and there's corn bunnies. Corn bunnies are extinct in Somerset, but not on the Marlborough Downs, they're everywhere. 
They have Montague's Harriers occasionally, they have Stone Curdies, they have Lapleys, they have quite a lot of um, predators. You know, they make it work and they produce food. It can be done, and there are hay meadows there. You know, we, what we can't do, clearly, and I don't think anyone here would argue this, we can't convert the whole countryside to some bucolic way of being that isn't productive. Of course it has to be productive. But at the moment, we've swung far too far the other way. I'm just going to play you the last clip, because um, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions, um, which is it's the clip that shows the consequence of the logic of the way the first clip you saw has led now. I'm going to let it run to the end, because it's the end of the series. If I stopped it where I was going to stop it, it's really depressing. So I'm going to let it run to the end, because it's a celebration. It's the end of the series, and it's a celebration of why we love birds. So bear with me, because I'm into birds. So if we can just run that last clip. The loss of these familiar boats is a timely warning about the state of the British countryside. But its significance goes far deeper than that. Their fate, and the fate of all our wildlife, is inextricably linked with our own emotional and spiritual well-being. Human beings have suddenly, in my lifetime, begun to understand that the presence of a healthy um, community of animals and mammals and birds and reptiles and insects is absolutely of huge importance to the health of the human spirit. And the landscape with diversity in it is central to being a human being. And I think if, as we destroy other species, we destroy something about ourselves. The loss of these birds matters because it is in the end an impoverishment. It happens quite gradually, so you don't notice it. Like you don't notice your hair going grey. But it happens, and when it's happened, you then notice it. And if these birds were to vanish altogether, our very concept of countryside would be under threat. If birds went out of the countryside, um, the surges would have from the lake and no birds sing to bring junkies back into this. Um, it would be a member of a kind of nuclear, post-nuclear deadness. If birds disappeared from the countryside, it wouldn't mean the same to call it the countryside. It would be the non-urban spaces. To live in a silent world would be a really dreadful thing, dreadful thing. The story of our nation's relationship with birds has been a long and eventful one. A journey from exploitation through appreciation to delight. For centuries, we regarded birds purely as objects to be used for our benefit, for food and fuel, sport and recreation. But gradually over time, we came to value them, cherish them, and finally to understand what they truly mean to us.
and a wildflower meadow. That's what the countryside means.